train going. Well, I've got one set up over here. It's called the Tricky Tumbler Test. <laughs> now, all I need now is someone to help me try it out. Ah, Sophie! Yesy, what do I have to do? Help me try it out, right? Right. Um, six tumblers. Yep. One, three and five got liquid in, mm -hmm. right? Now, what you have to do is get the ones with liquid in to positions one, two and three. But you're only allowed to touch one glass. Easy. I'll show you what you do. Move five over here and... Oh, no, that's moving the glass. Um... <laughs> well, if you... Oh. Do you want a clue? Yeah. How do you right. do it? Um, five into two. Five into... Oh, poor five into two. Mm. Brilliant, Joe. <laughs> and that is how you do <coughs> the tricky... <coughs> What's all this stuff? Oh, my goodness, it's coming from the mystery corner. <coughs> <laughs> That's spooky, isn't it? You can get a really good mysterious effect with all this mist and this smoke about the place. We've had a letter from Richard Hartnell. He says, I was watching Paul McCartney on television tonight. Can you tell me how they make the smoke on stage and um, does it smell nasty? Well, they, they make it, they being the visual effects people, with a machine like this. Thank you, Paul. If we just open it, can I have a look at this, which is called a dry ice machine? And inside it, you've got some dry ice. I'm putting a glove on. The reason for that will become clear in a minute. And I'll get a piece of it. Where are we? That is it. Now, it's, it's a bit like normal ice, except that normal ice is made from um, water that is frozen, and this is made from carbon dioxide. And they freeze it, and watch what happens when you put it in some warm water. It's good, isn't it? It all bubbles up like that. It turns into a vapour, and that's what they use to give the smoke effect. You have to use a glove because it'll hurt the, um, the fingers on your hand because it's carbon dioxide, but... Um, now, Richard wanted to know, um, does it smell nasty? Well, there's no smell at all to it. But it's not really the smell they're interested in, anyway. It's the actual visual effect of it. They put a few lumps in a cauldron to make it all bubbly and smoky like that. Or if they want to flood the stage or the set with it, they use the machine. Here it is. There's the dry ice in the centre of it, of that basket. In here is hot water. They lower the basket inside, and they can flood the whole stage with the smoke. We're going to just um, put the machine back together. Lower this, and you can have a look at what it looks like. Put the lid back on, and uh, turn the fan on so that you can get all the vapour through this tube. Because it's um, heavier than air, it'll stay around the floor and look dead good. Bye-bye. Have a good look at this. It's a letter from a rather mysteriously named Rebecca M from Stenning. And she says, Dear Corners, what is this part of your face called? And she's got a photograph there um, with some arrows pointing to that strange bit between your nose and your mouth. Well, I found out what it's called. It's the philtrum, and it comes from a Greek word meaning love potion, which is a bit strange. And it's just a, t a tuck or a fold of skin, which is even there before you're born. It starts to develop as your nose begins to grow. Well, it helps you smile, and um, if you smile, it completely flattens out. But the only real use I've found for it is um, as a rather useful parting when you're growing a moustache. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to hear a dirty joke? <laughs> Boy fell in the mud. <laughs> Actually, you lot must be quite a clean lot, judging from this huge pile of letters here, all wanting to know how soap is made. <laughs> well, no prizes to who's going to answer that question. Me old mate, Professor Saltminer. Now, I'll just bung it in my beam machine here. I've got this one here from Katie Bryan, and I'll beam a few more uh, later. Yes, so close it up. Now, um, press button A. There. Now, where is he? And... Ah, there he is. <laughs> oh, he looks busy, doesn't he? <laughs> oh, someone's on the blower with a question, I guess, and who's got all the answers? Professor Saltminer. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, 
Now, who's it? Kate O'Brien, aged six, Colin. How does soap make bubbles, and how is it made? Well, this is soap. In here, I have got coconut oil and caustic soda bubbling away very nicely. Now, it could be palm oil, it could be soybean oil, it could be groundnut oil, as long as it's oily, you see. Now, what happens is that the fatty acid inside the oil and the caustic soda come together and cause saponification, which means it makes soap. <laughs> How big of any. Now, what we need is a bit of salt to make the whole thing rise. There we are. Give it a minute while I activate the post-saponification semi-porous water extractor, or as we scientists call it, the fishing net. <laughs> What's this stuff? Get out of it. Now, what we have left is soap. There it is, the real stuff. Well, obviously, it's got to have a bit of uh, colour and a bit of shape put to it, but this, this is the basic stuff. Oh, lovely. Now, <clears throat> how does soap make bubbles? Well, come over here and I'll show you. <clears throat> you see, when we wash our hands in the water, we squidge about all the soap and rub air into the soapy water. And the soapy water covers this air with a film, you see, and traps the air inside. And that is how you make a bubble. Have a look. You see? There's the soapy film, and there's the air. Have a closer look. Gee! <laughs> Silly me. Never mind. Now what we need... Oh, uh, hang on, hang on. Uh, um... <coughs> Uh, Sarah Money from Milton Keynes calling. Why is it that no matter what colour the bar of soap, the soap suds and bubbles are always white? <laughs> Quite right, Sarah. And that is because no matter what colour it is, the amount of water around any one soap sud or bubble is so thin, so minute, there's not enough of it there to keep the colour. You see? <laughs> That's it for today, except to say, oh dearie me, my... Bubbling cauldron is bubbling over. <clears throat> oh, dearie me, my bubbling cauldron is bubbling over. Ah! No, 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 stay, stay there. I, I turn it off, turn it off. Um, oh, right. Uh, uh, well, um, cheerio and have a good many. <laughs> bee boo, bee boo, bee boo. Emergency, emergency. I can't find it. Where is it? Uh, uh, ah, here it is. Phew, a letter from Donna Brazier. And she says, Dear Corners, please could you tell me why people dial 999 in an emergency when 111 would be quicker? Well, that is a very sensible question. And we rang up British Telecom and they said this, that 50 years ago, 999 was decided upon as the emergency number because they were trying to find a number that would be easy and quick to call in the dark or in smoke or when you couldn't see. But that doesn't answer the question of why it wouldn't be quicker to dial 111 because if you have a look... It is, it's quicker, there's the one. One, one. Well, the reason is this. 50 years ago, they had overhead telephone wires, and those wires could actually tap out the number 111 in a strong wind, so they couldn't use that. And naught, naught, naught here, which it would also be quite easy, couldn't be used because the old number for the operator was naught, and as soon as you dialed the first naught, you get through to the operator. So they decided that nine would be easier. And what you're meant to do is feel around for the telephone, find the naught, and go one along to the nine. And that's why you dial 999 in an emergency. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Well, it's not that. Eh? Hey? Hello? 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 Darren Lindop wants to know how a yoghurt pot telephone works. Well, you'd better tell him then, hadn't you? <laughs> yeah, all right, no need to shout. Oh, I don't know. Now, you want, Darren Lindop wants to know how a yoghurt pot carton telephone works. This is one. It's made quite simply out of two yoghurt cartons with a bit of string or a bit of, um, well, that's cord stuck in between. Put a hole in the bottom of it there and uh, tie a knot in it and you've got your telephone. And when you speak into it, you can actually hear you at the other end. Sound There you go. You see? Now, um, Darren wants to know how it's actually made and how you can um, get your voice to go along the bit of string. Well, what happens is that all sound sets up a sound wave. It's invisible. If you hear a car outside or a musical instrument or somebody speaking, the sound comes from them in an invisible wave. And that wave sets up vibrations. Now, when you speak into the yoghurt carton, like that, 
it makes the bottom of the carton vibrate. And those vibrations, if the string is tight, will pass along the string right the way to the carton that the other person has and will cause the bottom of their carton to vibrate as well. And then those vibrations will make um, the sound waves again inside the carton that their ear can pick up so they can hear you. Now, you can only see it in the studio. Try it for yourself. It's easy to make and it sounds dead good. If you... Hello? Hello? What's, go what's going on? Hang on. Sophie? Sophie? It's me. Oh. Hey, Simon. Um, what do you get if you dial 666? I don't know. What do you get if you dial 666? Three policemen standing on the rigs. <sighs> <laughs> Over and out. Big good this, isn't it? I wonder who first thought of this idea. Tell you what, if you have ever invented anything of your own, you'll be interested in next week's programme, because it's all about inventions, so don't miss it. This buggy is just one of the inventions made by Keston Junior School in Old Coulsdon when they were experimenting to see which buggy could go the fastest. Look out for this in a minute. And while we were down at the school, Neil Freeman wanted to know um, how fast is the fastest car in the world? And that's also a question that we've had from Martin Beeson. Well, it is this. It's called the Thrust 2, and it's a jet engine car. And it was actually driven by Richard Noble in the Nevada desert in 1983, and it reached a speed of 633.468 miles an hour, which is pretty fast, you've got to admit. Well, I don't think that um, Keston were quite aiming for speeds like that, but they did come up with some pretty mean buggies. Well, have a look at some more of them. So how do you make your racing buggy then? Well, you take one of these mm -hmm. and um, push it in here quite hard. And it's a bit difficult. Yeah. And um, get another wheel. Yeah. Put that in there. Don't need to um, just put one wheel on and slot it through here because you've got the pegs and you lift them up. And you're lucky enough to have an assistant here to help you? So those pegs are, are already stuck onto the cardboard, are they? Yeah. Yeah. You get the other one. Mm-hmm. That on. That. Right. Assistant, come and do the pegs. Right. Oh, bit tricky, that bit. Perfect. Uh, right. Looks as though it's ready for a run. You've got a brilliant buggy here. Tell me how it works. Well, you get um, the battery and mm -hmm. it's fixed onto these clips and all the wire comes into it. And when you turn it on with this button here, mm -hmm. all the lights turn on and um, this is the motor and this bit helps it drive. And you, if you turn the battery around the wrong way, it goes backwards and forwards if you turn it back again. So it's driven by this elastic band, is it? Yes. Can we see that working? Can you do that for me? Wow! Bye! And finally, a puzzle. What you've got to do is guess which fizzy drink can buggy is going to be first at the line. We've got Matthew, Sarah and Mandy, numbers one, two and three. So, you ready? On your marks, get set. Go! You're all champs, so come here. Let's have a champs cheer.